Well, welcome to another March 4th. It has been a while, but we are back. I'm um, here with Jason Council, partner in productivity. And with us for this edition of March 4th is Rhyme Fest, uh, rapper, creator, artist, extraordinaries out uh, with a new album that we definitely want to talk about that's based off of this historic conversation between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni uh, back in 71 this conversation was, and you're bringing it back thematically uh, in this album. It's grown folk music, but it sounds good. So first of all, thank you, Che Rhymefest, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, Jason, why don't you just kick it off? Well, it's, it's real, it feels really good to be back in the saddle. So thank you to everyone who's been following and supporting the movement. It's great to be back. And wouldn't be more honored than having someone like Rhymefest with us today. As you know, March 4th is a call to action. It's the only calendar date that does so. So when we think about a person who's not only current day, but their life and their body of work really epitomizes what it means to be a servant and someone who calls to action, couldn't be more excited than to have Ryan Fest with us today. So I'll kick us off with the first question. You know, in the spirit of the conversation between the iconic conversation between Nikki and James, I can't help but think about 71 to 24 right, and the time frame, and also it's been about 18 years since your last studio album. So why don't you tell us and tell the people what you've been up to and what made you come out with this project at this time? Well, you know, I think in the environment that we're in today, we tend to believe that we have to continuously feed the machine or we're irrelevant, we're not human, we don't have spirit or nobody's connecting with us. But man, I was able to connect with uh, one of my friends. He wrote a musical called Memphis. And I asked him one day, how long did it take you to write a musical? And he said, oh, a rapper would never do it. Before he even told me how long it took him, he said a rapper would never do it. I said, man, that's prejudice. How long did it take you? He said it took me. <laughs> He said, it took me 12 years to write this musical. When I think of people like Gershwin, when I think of people like Philip Glass or classical conductors, they may take two years to write an orchestra or a symphony or a classical, you know, co composition. Why do we cheapen our gifts and cheapen our art by saying if we don't constantly feed the machine, we're irrelevant? So, you know, that, that, that conversation that James and Nikki had 52 years ago that still resonates today is because they took time to cultivate and curate and take care of their words. One of the, one of the quotes in this project, James Baldwin said, there is such a thing as a living word and we have a responsibility to the actions produced by the word. That means what you say that people move on is your responsibility, whatever that action is that they move on from your word. And so, you know, I don't look so much at the time between uh, Blue Collar and uh, James and Nikki. What I look at is the maturation, the experience, and the ability to say a word that has heft to it. And so I believe that this project is the word that needed to be spoken in this time. Well, tell me now about the the sort of work that you have been doing over this period, because it's not like you've been uh, mm -hmm. idle by, by any stretch. Some people might not know. Way back in the day, you worked with Kanye on Jesus Walks, but you also worked uh, with Common and John Legend on Glory, mm -hmm. on that song. You've been involved with some other projects, movies as yeah. well. So what has your kind of creative inspiration and focus been? You know, take take yeah. the numbers and, you know, whatever, so, whatever cadence off the table. Yeah, so, you know, I have, to your point, bro, I have been doing a lot of things. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, I helped write the Oscar award winning song, Glory which I, I've seen turn into like kind of a black national anthem sung at graduations and school events and Black History Month. I think that's beautiful. Um, I've also been on seven world tours with DJ Jazzy Jeff. We have an independent project called uh, M3. And DJ Jazzy Jeff, I would say for the last eight years, has been mentoring me on how to be a hip hop artist over 35. 
he's been showing me how to do hip hop and stay relevant and healthy uh, globally uh, when the light of the industry is not shining on you and still make a living. He, DJ Jazzy, the magnificent DJ Jazzy Jeff is a guru and I'm honored to have emceed for him throughout the world. And that's where I got kind of uh, inspired with these world travels and these world spiritual retreats. And, you know, we've been building schools. Uh, my wife and I have a school that we support uh, in uh, Arusha, Tanzania, called Gogatha, which is ranked number eight in the nation for uh, the, the education that it gives to young people. Uh, we support an art uh, school in Dakar, Senegal. We are building a school in water wells in the sub-Saharan desert of Mauritania. Uh, you know, so we're doing a lot of international work, but at the same time, I've been at the University of Chicago. I received the Axelrod Pritzker Fellowship at the Institute of Politics. So, you know, I've been at the University of Chicago doing seminars about the intersection between culture and politics and how our culture has currency that we can leverage for social and political justice. Let me get you to pause for just a second because there's something that you said that I wanna understand more about. And you talked about how to be um, relevant, uh, active, and, and, you know, implied, but perhaps not said solvent, right? As an artist, as a hip hop artist after 35, how DJ Jazzy Jeff has sort of been schooling you on that. There's a lot of this generation who think that what you see on Spotify or YouTube, you know, numbers wise is all that really exists, right? But between live performance and other ancillary things, there are so many other ways that you can move. So break down for us, how do you? Well, I will start with this, and I'll tell you something I learned in politics, but this applies to pretty much everything. You need about 11 to 12 impressions before people actually know that your product or your thing exists. So if you have numbers on YouTube or Spotify, that's one impression. If are you performing? That's a second impression. Are you, do you have relationships where maybe you're on TV? That's a third impression. You need to get as many impressions as possible. And that's more than just a number. That number is one um, metric. And I think sometimes young people look at that number and it becomes the number becomes their identity. I never really concentrated on the number. I said, man, you know, if I got a medium number, and I can go make all these other impressions, I can create a career and standard of life for myself. And that's one of the things that I'm teaching young people about uh, the music business, because I know so many people, bro, they got a million Instagram followers, but are hitting me up like, how did you get in a movie with Emilio Estevez? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How do you get these opportunities that you get when I have more followers than you, or I get more likes than you? It's because I'm creating more impressions through the outside interpersonal relationships created. Ryan, you know what, you mentioned something earlier and I heard you mention it in previous interviews. I wanted you to unpack cultural currency for the folks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. And I've been giving this example all over the place, but I think it's a very good example. Uh, for 15 to 20 years, Congressman John Conyers was trying to get a national uh, holiday pass for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Reagan and Senator Helms were holding it up for 15 years until Cong Congressman Conyers called Stevie Wonder and said, make me a song. And that song was called Happy Birthday. And in the next year after, happy birthday to ya, happy birthday, one year to that date, Senator Helms said, by tyranny of majority, we have to pass a national Dr. King holiday. The music opened up the hearts of the people to get legislation passed. That's cultural currency being leveraged for political justice. Mm. Well, I know, thank you. I know John brought up the album and um, I'll kick us off with an album related question. One of the things I really respect about your artistry is your intentionality around cross-generational connectivity. Right. So I couldn't hear Edelberry without asking you the question, what did folks like your grandmother and the elders in your community, how did that shape your leadership style? Yo, that question right there takes me back to the intro that you guys gave. This is not 
only grown folks music. This is intergenerational conversations. That's why I don't even call it an album. I call it a composition. It's a revised book. It's if you take the Aramaic uh, Bible tablets and you just throw it on the table for a Christian and say, read that. They don't, what? Like it had to be revised by King James. You needed a new edition for another generation. Well, that's what I did with this conversation with James and Nikki. I revised it and I made it accessible so that Nikki Giovanni could see the fruits of her work. And then we could take that fruit and create seeds for tomorrow's fruits. I just pray I get to see what she gets to see. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about elderberry, I'll tell you a small story. My grandmother in the last few years of her life had dementia. And the way I dealt with my grandma, her dementia, was I gave her the gift that she gave me. The gift my grandma gave me growing up was music. We would sing uh, uh, um, the Commodore's Zoom. We would sing Stairway to Heaven by the OJs. We would sing Al Green, Let's Stay Together. And although the dementia took all of her memory, bro, it never took the music. So when I would go with my grandma, the only thing she could remember were the lyrics to the song. And that's how I knew how powerful music was, that somebody could make a song so tender that someone who forgot everything would remember the words and rhythm of that song. I pray, I pray that I can make a song so beautiful that somebody who forgets everything can be vibrating and remember that remember those words. And so although my, my grandmother and I couldn't share the memories of experiences, we could share, I'm on the stairway to heaven, going step by step. And we sung that song a week before she passed. And that's why, that's where Elderberry, that was my fruit. My grandmother was my fruit, man. She held on to me when I didn't understand my grandfather. She held on to me when the men in the family were being too hard on me. And I, and I was writing poetry and they were playing basketball and I was writing raps and they was like, why is he not out here wrestling? You know what I mean? My grandmother kind of ushered me through it and helped me to understand the men in the family, helped me to get with the men in the family and, and, and embrace my own masculinity. I was pushed out there by the elderberry. And, and at the end of her life, we shared that music together. And that's where that song came from. Wow, wow. Talk, talking about conversations with your grandmother, <laughs> tell me about the conversation that you had with Nikki Giovanni, oh. right? About putting this project out in the first place. Because one of the first things that I thought when I, the first song I heard off of this was Creator, because I have a process I go through, you know, uh, Spotify's New Music Friday. I go through the whole thing, listen to stuff, and then uh, take the things that I really like and put them on a, a playlist. And so your song Creator came out. I was like, oh, this is, this is good. And uh, only later did I get linked up with, uh, with your people to do this conversation. But when I heard the voices, Baldwin and Giovanni, how did he get permission to do this? Turns out you had a conversation with her T tell us about i that. did i did well you know it started with a demo it didn't start with me getting clearance it didn't start with me being uh with golden state entertainment it started with me seeing those clips on the internet and saying wow this is still relevant then going seeing the two-hour conversation and saying man how can i unpack this and make it accessible for people today i know how Beats and rhymes. Beats and rhymes make everything accessible. And so I, t I, I got my phone disconnected and I got a landline and I told people, you can't text me or have access to me for the next three months. I'm going to put this together. And if you want to talk to me, call me on the landline. And guess what? Nobody called me because no one wants to talk to you. They just want to think they have access to you and distract you with text messages and beans and bongs. So, you know, when I got that out the way, and I started making this demo and it was done. I found someone who had access to uh, Nikki and I had them send it to her. And she called me on the phone and said, son, I heard what you did and Jimmy would be so proud of you. Mm -hmm. Only somebody who knew James Baldwin can call him Jimmy. Mm -hmm. She said, Jimmy would be so proud of you. This is why Jimmy wrote. 
This is what he wrote for, for people like you to do what you just did. This is why I write. Thank you so much. She said, and I know, it, it, this is before I go to state. She said, I know you're going to want me to go out there with you, but I want you to know you already got me. I'm out there with you. Put this out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ooh, the oracle just called me, blessed it, blessed me, and said, now go forward, young man. I gave you a piece of my spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, that right there, bro, nobody could tell me it's weak. Nobody could say nothing to me about this. You know what I mean? And But, but the demo, I'll tell you what it didn't have and what I knew I had to add to it after I spoke to Nikki Giovanni. I had to add co-authors in the spirit of Nikki Giovanni. And that's why I went out there and got five women MCs and added them on the project. Because if I'm coming in the spirit of James, they had to respond to me in the spirit of Nikki. They had to they had to see the angles I didn't see. They had to question me about what I was rapping about. And you didn't just go get five women MCs. You got five fire women MCs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they killed it. When I listened yeah. to the project, you know, I've been listening to it since it came out. So when John said, you know, we're going to have an opportunity to dialogue with you, I was beyond excited. Because one of the lines you said towards the end of the project was, imagine the truth when it all bends. Unpack on. that. Unpack that for us. All right. I'll, I'll unpack it by asking you a question. Mm-hmm. Are you the same person you were three years ago? Not even three days ago, my brother. What if somebody held you to that standard? Right. right. <laughs> the right. truth is always evolving. It's always bending. What you believe three days ago, you don't believe today. If I took you as the man that you were a year ago when we had a disagreement, we never had a disagreement, by the way, but when we, if we had a disagreement a year ago and I held you to that standard today and there was no forgiveness, I would not even see who you've matured to be. I have to look at everybody and the things that I took offense to, even in my own family, even in uh, my relationships with my colleagues, with my peers. Mm -hmm. I have to look at them as who they are today, not as who they were when the misunderstanding happened. The truth is always bending. Right. Okay. Okay. It's it's bending. And yet uh, 50 plus years after this conversation between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni happened, it still rings true. How? You, well, you told me it rings true. How? I'm just, I, I'm, just <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible, of course, yeah. but I'm setting up the nuance in the bending, right? Mm, the truth mm. might be bending, but there are some truths. How does it, how does it survive being bent? Well, I think that on the project, James and Nikki are speaking in alchemy and they're talking about the elasticity of truth. Look, Nikki Giovanni on this project says, lie to me and you will. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? If you're going off with Becky or whoever, you're lying to me. Why don't you just smile at me like you smile at him? She's talking, and my wife listened to that and was like, I don't know if I want that. Like, and I. You know, there's a part where they where, where, where James Baldwin says, "Ooh, what we did with Jesus, we took that cat over." You know what I'm saying? Like, G- and 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 you know, uh, uh, Cap D from GSC was like, you know, what what did he say? He said, "There's there's one God and 30 million of us. Without us, there would be no God." This is what James Baldwin says on the same song you're quoting. The the the, the chief business officer said, "Hey man, can you take that off?" <laughs> like so you know they were dealing in this conversation with the bending of truths with you know the world is what we say it is what we create it to be so you know i think one of the issues we have in society society today is the the extremism of dogmatism so you know and and and, and i'm gonna tell you something i i got a house in wyoming right and so every spring and summer, I go to Cody, Wyoming, spend time there. I got friends who are Trump supporters. I have friends who are Mormons. Uh, I go back to Chicago in the winter and fall. I have friends who are black Israelites, Nation of Islam, uh, Democrats, everything in between. One of the things that I find, I'm doing an interview right now, brother.
Huh? Just lower my voice. Okay, that's I can do that. Thank you, brother. No worries. I am. I'm on the tenth floor. I love my. I, I have two earphones. I'm sorry, I was loud. You you good, bro? Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Hey man, you see how we got dealing love? It's yeah. got to be like, hey, what the brother is saying is is right. I was loud, and I have to not be so in what I'm doing that I'm disturbing others and not caring. And that's where I was going with this extremism. Sometimes we're so selfish in what we think. What I've noticed is that my Trump friends, my black Israelite friends, my my Nation of Islam friends, my Democrat, Republican friends, they really all believe in the same thing. They just don't know it because they're not together. Mm. Anything that's extreme is the same thing on two opposite ends. And what I'm looking for is everybody to talk to the people in their group and people of understanding to speak to one another. Tell us about um, Golden State Entertainment, the, the Golden State Warriors entertainment wing that you put this out with. Uh, why that route? How did that relationship come together? Golden State Entertainment Base well, my, my my guy Cap D hit me up, and Golden State Entertainment basically uh, was like, "Yo, Fest, we you got to put another album out. You got to put some more music out." And I was saying, "Look, man, I don't sign the record labels. I don't want to be on a record label." And they said, "This is not a record label. This is an entertainment uh, uh, company. And the way we built the Warriors, we're going to build culture. We're going to build art." We're going to build in community. And I said, well, I don't want to do anything for clicks, cash, and prizes, bro. And and then he, he came at me with a question. And the question was, what would success look like to you? I've never been asked that by any business, by any entertainment company, what my definition of success was. And the answer I gave was impact. If I could do something that made an impact communally, that would be success. And and Cap said, us too. Let's do something that makes impact. And then we signed a strategic partnership. So John, we've been clearly doing this too long because you keep asking questions that I want to ask. But Ryan, in the spirit of definition, you know, I want to pivot a little bit and, and get more into not that they're mutually exclusive, but you as an artist and you as a person. I would love to hear you put on your, your hat as an artist and a person and, and tell us what is your personal definition of hip hop? Hip hop to me is the, the, the fastest spreading language in the history of humanity. My, my, my uh, example to you is if you go to Iran, where they love poetry in Iran, the Persians love poetry, and they may be able to quote to you 18th century uh, Hafez uh, poet or Rumi. Uh, we don't know Hafez, we don't know Rumi, but guess what else they know? They know 50 cent verses. They know uh, Jay-Z put me anywhere on God's green earth and I'll triple my work. They can give you a Jay-Z quote. So while we can't give you a quote of their poetry, they can give you a quote of ours. When I go to Cartagena, Colombia, and the guys walk next to me with their radio and they rap in Spanish, I don't know Spanish. Why do I understand what they're saying? When I start rapping back to them in English, why do they understand the spirit of where I'm coming from? Hip hop is a language. When I go to Brasilia, bro, and I see the art on the wall and the graffiti and the modern day calligraphy that we call graffiti on the wall, why do I know what neighborhood I'm in? You know, like that hip hop has been the fastest spreading language through culture in the history of mankind. The issue we have with hip hop is that we're people are so caught up in pimping the gift that nobody is leveraging it for justice, peace and spirituality. And that's where James and Nikki comes in. Mm. Thank you. All right. What what? advice would you give to aspiring young artists, 
you know, hip hop artists, producers, etc. cetera. Um, my oldest son is 15. I put him in that category. He started to rhyme. He's in Logic Pro, putting together his compositions. He's taking piano for quite a while. He's taking uh, choir, you know, chorus in school and is out there singing for the first time. And, you know, I, I tell him things here and there from what I observe in the industry about maintaining independence and uh, making sure you don't let the, the numbers twist you. But for somebody who's been in the game for a long time and uh, has done it on his terms, what would you say? Well, first of all, I, I want to pivot back and then I'll pivot forward. Another example to prove uh, hip hop's global dominance. I'll never forget when I was in Croatia and one of the guys said to me, hey man, Wu-Tang Clan helped us get through a civil war when the Yugoslav was breaking up. We used to play and neighbors were fighting neighbors. We used to play Wu-Tang every day and the young people got together in the underground basements and we just vibed out to Wu-Tang and we wore camouflage like Wu-Tang because we were in a civil war. Like, but to your to your child, to your son, um, your story is the best song in the world, isn't it? What's your son's name? Nathan. I want to tell, let, let me give a, a message to Nathan. Nathan, I'm going to tell you what Dr. Don DeWest told me. I'm going to tell you the same advice that created College Dropout, that created Jesus Walks, that created All Falls Down. When Dr. Don DeWest would hear me rapping about how many drugs I sold, how many people I killed, how many girls I slept with. She took me to the side and said, Ron Fest, where's your mom? Oh man, my mother, she works two jobs. And you know, Ron Fest, where's your dad? I don't know, I ain't really, you know, been in contact with my dad. Wow, what do you want for your sister then? And then I told her, you know, I, I, I would hope my sister would, you know, and I gave her the story. She said, wow. That's the best song you haven't written. And I'm gonna tell you something, Ryan Fest, and I'm gonna tell you something, Nathan. Whatever you're doing music about, if it's not you, that's the identity you're gonna be stuck in. That's gonna be who people expect you to be, the character that you created. And you have to think to yourself, do you wanna be looked at as the character you created or the authentic you with the story we haven't heard yet? Nathan, all young people, tell your story. We haven't heard that. That's the authenticity we're looking for that evolves hip hop. If you do the same thing your peers are doing, you're replicating and we're going nowhere. If you do the same thing we did back in the day, that's ridiculous because you're not pivoting and moving forward. But if you tell your story, we can grow from that. I love that advice. I'm, I'm certainly gonna pass it along. I wanna push you though because he's already doing that. He's telling his story. He's being authentic with it. He's bringing new sound. So maybe even on the business side, what would you say to him? Mm. You know, on the business side, how old is Nathan? He's 15. Well, he has a father. <laughs> like you, <laughs> you, you are the eyes, you know, we, we, I'm going to tell you the biggest thing we're always telling somebody how to do their own business or what to do to look out for your business you know I, I think that's a pitfall there's nothing that we can do to cover all bases we need people to look out for us man we need a team a lot of the biggest business deals that i got taken advantage on is not because i didn't it's because i didn't know every aspect and there was no way i could have known every aspect i didn't have the people around me and, and, you know, so what I would advise Nathan on the business side, make good relationships and get a good team that you all trust each other and can grow something together. We need Village. Ryan, one of the things is I think this is a great segue since since you spoke so eloquently to Nathan. And I'm sure John needs a moment to just process that that, that special message. For those who don't know, your first name is Che, and I really yes. appreciate how you leaned into what the prophecy means when you're named after someone and how you wouldn't let your name be Che and you not be someone who was rooted in revolution, revolt, activism. Then I saw you named your oldest son, forgive me if I'm wrong, Solomon, right, out of wisdom. I see you have three babies. Do you mind telling the people the other two's name and, and what was the, the reasoning behind those? Yo, you you know, it's, it's really crazy with my two daughters one of the biggest 
dysfunctions I have with their mothers is that, is that they didn't allow me to name those children. They didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't understand, you know what I'm saying? And because we weren't together in relationships, yeah. it was like certain things were taken, gifts that I wanted to bestow on my children, yeah. like, like the power of the name, you know? And, I, you know, my 16 year old, I just call her what I want to call her. I call her a, a mirror. Mm. And that's the name that I share with her which is princess, you know, in mm -hmm. Arabic. And, um, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I still go through, you know, it's, it, you can listen to somebody and it sounds like they, we got all the answers to everything, but that's only because we've been through things that have caused certain types of pain that have led to understand certain understandings, certain um, desires. I mean, one of my cravings and, and wishes and prayers is for grace because I've been through certain frustrations where the only thing that's going to help me have peace is grace, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the naming of my two children is one of those things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as, as we start to wrap up, does that make up, sense to what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for being so transparent. Yeah. And I think more, more men, more men, and more black men need to be more transparent about our hurt, about yes. our offenses, about the, you know, um, especially black men, like, you know, parenting, uh, parenting is you're watching the future you, and you want you in the future to be better than you in the present. And, and sometimes the relationships it's not even us as parents as black men it's us as men who were not taught how to be in healthy relationships that affects the future us you know and uh that's that's one of the things that in my relation that's what creator was about that's why i want everybody to look at that creator video because that video was about how can we love each other in divine grace and divine forgiveness? We've done more good together than we've done bad together. And so, you know, when Brittany Carter responds and say, if I cannot show you grace, then I'm not who I say I am. And when I lay my head on your chest, it, just know it ain't no pressure, brother. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what we need to hear, that we're loved. You know what I'm saying? Through, throughout the good and the bad. Yeah. And so that, you know, this project is more than just a shout out to the ancestors or black relationships or, you know, this is about men and how can we get love right? And, and I'm still working on that in real time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we draw to a close, that, that makes me uh, think of something else that struck me about the context of the Giovanni Baldwin conversation. The, the culture has moved quite a ways uh in in openness since james baldwin's time and the fact that you have a gay black man in this conversation who as you remake this conversation and and sort of bring it forth for all generations you're representing him and doing it comfortably in your own sense of self and masculinity unpack that for us a bit in that conversation, uh, James Baldwin actually showed us the way because when he was speaking to Nikki, he started to speak through the lens of a straight black male, of a married black male to her. And that conversation, they were husband and wife, poet to poet, teacher to student. It was all kind of things going on in the alchemy of that conversation. So why should I be uncomfortable? You know, she said, you know, Nikki Giovanni had a part where she said, how do we do this? How do we make this happen? And he says, sweetheart, the ancestors already did it for us. I had to go. Now he's an ancestor. And I had to go back and say, James, teach me how to transcend all things. <laughs> you know, um, you know, he James Baldwin has this uh, line that I love to say when I'm rapping. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, fire next time. If we can't learn, man, like 
you know, hip hop taught us a lot of great things. We've been talking about the good of hip hop, but hip hop also gave us some toxicity and toxic ways of thinking about one another and, and, um, and sexuality. And, um, I'm learning not to judge good and bad. Everything is good and bad. Like, so, you know, um, what I'm learning and what I'm finding, brother, is that um, who a person loves, that's who they love, bro. Like, for me, who I love is who I love. You know what I mean? The important thing here is what are your values? Value systems. Value systems go deeper than skin. Value systems go deeper than uh ideologies and identities value systems and the biggest thing you can learn from james baldwin is a healthy value system i guess before john closes us out i just want to give you your flowers in the spirit of march 4th just want to thank you for being an academian an artist a global activist and continuing to show through your example through positive peer pressure, what it looks like to really harness and leverage your gifts, my brother. Thank you. Mm, mm, love is a good thing. Thank you, brother. Indeed, we appreciate you. Rhyme Fest for March 4th, uh, 2024. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. I appreciate you all having me. Have a good one.